Uh, next presenters will be Dr. Andy Fisher and Harrison Ruth Tyler uh, for the Department of History of Women Mary. Uh, their presentation will be on teaching the past to change the future, history, education, and land back in the real world. Thank you. It's just, it's just me, just the one person. Um, I'm uh, Professor Andy Fisher from the College of William & Mary, just down the street. Uh, I've been a member of the History Department there for 18 years now. Um, so this is much longer than I thought I would be living and teaching this far east, because I'm from the Pacific Northwest. And in all that time, I've stubbornly maintained my research focus in the Northwest. Um, both for you know, reasons of personal affinity, but also because I think as someone uh, in the field of Native American Indigenous Studies, it's incumbent on scholars uh, to show their face and, and um, be accountable and be present for the communities they work with, not be dilettantes who flit from one community to another and one history and appropriate and um, use it to advance their career and, and give nothing back. So um, I've also, in, in recent years, uh, begun doing, in addition to my, my scholarly publications, litigation support work, uh, particularly on behalf of the Yakima Nation. And what you're looking at here is uh, members of the Yakima Tribal Council uh, at an event recently last month uh, commemorating the 50th anniversary of the restoration of some 21,000 acres of land, only a portion of what they are entitled to, um, more than 100,000 acres. But uh, in 1972, President Nixon, of all people, uh, signed an executive order uh, returning 21,000 acres of land that had been placed into a national forest due to erroneous boundary surveys. And that land included the eastern side of Pato, uh, which means standing high in the Ichiskin Sinwit language of the Yakima people. It is a 12,000 plus foot snow peak in the Cascade Mountains that is regarded as uh, one of the sources of all life because all life comes from water and water flows from the snows uh, that fall on Mount Adams. Um, it is also regarded as a witness to their treaty with the federal government in 1855. And I'll tell you more about, about this event which I was privileged to attend. Um, thank you, of course, for having me here uh, as well. And I hope to make this relevant to the people in this room even though I'm talking about uh, a nation uh, and events all the way on the other side of the continent. There are certainly many uh, parallels. I want to start, though. Um, well, I was going to start, but I don't know how to do it on here. <laughs> um, I was going to show you a clip from uh, the show Reservation Dogs, uh, which if you haven't seen, uh, you should watch. This is a new Hulu series. It's, um, it's actually the link there. It's OK, though. Um, in the interest of time, I'll just talk about it briefly. But this show um, is uh, indigenous produced. It's Sterling Harjo, Seminole Muskogee, uh, and Taika Waititi, the Maori uh, producer and director from New Zealand. Uh, and it focuses on uh, native uh, teenagers in Oklahoma. And in the clip I was going to show, um, there's a white couple and they're driving into Oklahoma. And on the back of the Welcome to Oklahoma sign, someone has scrawled in, sp in spray paint, land back. And the husband starts saying, what does that mean? What is land back? They want everything? What do they, the whole thing? And she says, no, I think it's just part of it, you know, just a little bit. And he's like, so they just want some of their land back? And, and she's like, yeah, and they were treated very poorly. Um, and he's, he's pretty confused by the whole thing. But I think it speaks to the fact that um, a lot of Americans don't understand land back. They, it's a slogan, it's a hashtag, um, but they can't wrap their heads around how it would actually work. Like, like uh, defund the police or you know, other slogans that make their way into politics, it's uh, a simple way of representing a very complicated idea, but also one that's you know, bound up with issues of, of restorative uh, justice uh, and um, so social justice generally. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about you know, the themes that um, are going to guide this presentation, but also you know, my teaching generally, uh, particularly when I, I teach Native American history, which is what I'm currently doing uh, at the college. Uh, the first point is that history matters here and now. Uh, that's why it's so hotly contested in our culture and politics. Um, and this has been true for a long time, although right now you know, it's all the bugaboo of critical race theory. Um, 
you know, so we understand uh, that, you know, history is contested ground. Um, but that is also what makes it important to teach as a subject in this STEM crazy world we live in. You know, history, the humanities uh, have an important uh, place, uh, important contributions to make to our, our public discourse. And I think most people in this room will agree that most American children do not learn enough, if anything, about indigenous histories or tribal sovereignty. This, this other aspect of American government it's under, under our federal system uh, is not adequately taught. And Native American history beyond the 19th century, and in Virginia for a long time, beyond the 17th century, you know, wasn't adequately taught and still isn't. I had a kid just come up through our school system. So I know even though the SOLs have nodded in this direction, uh, we still don't do enough to teach people about Native American history and federal Indian law and policy, uh, which are the constraints under which, you know, Native communities uh, live. Another point uh, that I try to convey to students is that sovereign rights recognized and reserved in the past must be respected and protected today because history isn't over. Um, I'm stealing from Faulkner here, and I don't encourage plagiarism, but uh, history isn't over, it's not even past. It's a famous quote from, from Faulkner. And um, particularly for Native communities, uh, history matters, and it can get into places like Congress and in the courts where what historians teach and write about Native Americans and their history can affect their material interests in the present. So as educators at all levels, we have an obligation to get it, to get it right. And also, as, as other presenters have said, to include it, uh, to bring it in in meaningful ways. And the last point here, and the one that goes to the heart of this presentation, is that land back, hashtag land back, is not simply a slogan. Uh, the restoration of indigenous territory has happened in the past and can happen again. And the ceremony I attended last month uh, out on the Yakima Reservation uh, is a concrete example of that. It's more than 50 years old now. If you're not familiar, uh, the Yakima Reservation, the Yakima Nation, is one of several tribal confederations that was created by treaty with the federal government in 1855 and set aside a very large reservation on the east side of the Cascades in what is now Washington State. Um, and it involved the removal of many Native communities from their ancestral homelands along the Columbia River. And a lot of this story is familiar. And you, any place you look in the history of uh, federal Indian relations, uh, you see cases like this where Native leaders were coerced into signing an agreement to sell off you know, hundreds of millions of acres of land that they didn't really even claim to own um, in, the, in the European sense. So you see you know, in a reference here you know, to the Godfather, kind of a mafioso approach where uh, federal commissioners are shaking down you know, tribal leaders and on the one hand promising them great benefits. You know, here's the carrot if you sign the treaty. Um, and Stevens, who was the uh, federal commissioner for Washington Territory said, whatever is done is done with your free consent. I'm going to give you all this stuff, schools and plows and grist mills and, you know, it's basically, what do, you, what do I need to do to get you in the reservation today, my friend, because I like you and it'd be a shame if something bad happened to you. Uh, which is what happens here in the second quote from Joel Palmer, uh, Stevens' uh, counterpart from the Oregon Territory, uh, threatening Native people with losing everything if they don't take the deal behind curtain number one. Uh, basically, he invokes the spirit of manifest destiny. We can't stop what's coming. So make a deal uh, or you'll lose everything. You cannot stop them. Our chief cannot stop them. We cannot stop them. So this is a treaty signed you know, under duress. Uh, Native people objected, raising both practical and spiritual objections to the loss of, of their land, to the sale of land, which as you can see here in this quote from Alhai, uh, they didn't claim to own. He said, God named this land to us. That is the reason I'm afraid to say anything about this land. I'm afraid of the laws of the Almighty. This is the reason I'm afraid to speak of the land. And he goes on to say, uh, shall I say, I will give you my lands. I cannot say, I am afraid of the Almighty. I love my life is the reason why I do not give my lands away. I'm afraid I would be sent to hell. So selling land uh, was an alien concept, and they did not claim uh, ownership. They claimed to belong to the land, not that it belonged 
uh, to them. But uh, at the end of the day, Stevens threatened them uh, if they did not sign. He said, uh, according to one source who was a witness there, when the Indians hesitated, the governor said to tell the chief, if they don't sign the treaty, they will walk in blood knee deep. This is an interesting piece. And I, I use primary documents a lot in the classroom. So students see, I'm not making this up. And people actually said this. But what's interesting about this quote is that it's not in the official proceedings of the Treaty Council. It's recorded by uh, another witness there, a white man. Um, and so it begs the question, why is it not in there? Is it because uh, it wasn't said, although he said it was said? Is it because it wasn't recorded by the secretary? Or is it because it didn't reflect particularly well on Governor Stevens and the US government to have him threatening tribes with bloodshed uh, if they refused to sign a treaty that he had earlier said would only be signed by their free consent? Um, ultimately, Kamayakan, the designated head chief of the Yakama Nation, did sign the agreement. Um, and all he said was, let them do as they have promised. That is all I have to say. And the Yakima Nation, like Native nations generally, has spent the last more than 150 years now trying to get the federal government and the states to honor their promises uh, under the treaty. One of those promises involved you know, the reservation of land. And this is, you're looking at the treaty map uh, that was drawn up and was shown to tribal representatives in Walla Walla in 1855. You can see um, the dotted line there, the smaller area, is the Yakima Reservation. And on the far left, you can see maybe barely, it says Mount Adams, or Pato, um, as the Yakimas call, this important marker on the boundary. And in the treaty itself, it says that the boundary passes south and east of Mount Adams um, to the spur whence flows the waters of the Klickitat and Pisco rivers. So it says south and east in the treaty itself, but the Yakima representatives couldn't read the treaty they signed or marked uh, at the end of the negotiations. Instead, what they retained were the verbal descriptions and I've underlined the important portion there. It says, thence down the main chain of the Cascades Mountains uh, south of Mount Adams. So it says south, and the map, if you look at it, do I have a pointer on here? Yeah. You can see that the boundary line goes south of Mount Adams and then curves around and goes along this mountain chain called the, the, Sis, the Simcoe Mountains. So on the map and in Stevens' words, it very clearly says that this area around Mount Adams, which comes to be known as Track D, is part of the reservation. And it contained important uh, root digging grounds and other uh, food and medicinal plant gathering areas. Um, and it was recognized both by the Yakimas and federal commissioners as an important place for them. So pretty clearly, it's supposed to be in the reservation. But long story short, and I don't want to get into the weeds, the federal government then lost the map, <laughs> lost the treaty map when it was transmitted to Washington, DC. It wasn't recovered for 75 years. So you know, yeah. federal recognition is great, but then you also have federal bureaucrats <laughs> managing your property. Um, and they might lose things. But um, the map was misplaced. The federal government failed to survey the entire boundary or mark it. And so over the next 50 to 60 years, Non-native settlers began moving into this area, Track D, establishing towns, homesteading, um, and basically assuming that uh, this land was theirs and it wasn't part of the reservation. Native people complained, and over several decades, the federal government did finally conduct multiple surveys. Uh, but up until the 1930s, they kept getting it wrong to the tune of hundreds of thousands of acres excluded from the Yakima Reservation. You can see one boundary drew it like 20 miles short of the Cascades. Um, and then to meet the description in the written treaty, they said, oh, south and east? That means southeast of Mount Adams. Not south and then east, but southeast, which cut out Track D, 121,000 acres. All of this despite Yakima saying over and over again, we know the landscape. 
We know what we heard. We know what makes sense. Because there's no, in the, you read the boundary description, there are no straight lines in it. It's all, rim, it's all rivers and ridges, because using natural features. But the government just draws a straight line from one point to another and says, that's where the boundary is. So around and around it goes. It wasn't until 1930 when the map was rediscovered in the government's files that the Bureau of Indian Affairs was willing to listen to the Acoma leaders and say, oh, okay, maybe, maybe we got it wrong. Like, really wrong, like hundreds of thousands of acres wrong. Again, long story short, it took the Yakimas another 38 years to have their rights to tract deed vindicated by the Indian Claims Commission. But in 1968, the federal government said, we wrongfully took tract D from the Yakima Nation, um, but you can't have the land back. You can only get paid for it. And the Yakima said, we don't want to sell any land. We don't want to sell our sacred mountain. We want whatever property can be uh, restored to us. And that's why in 1972, Nixon signed that executive order, giving back 21,000 acres of 121,000 acres they were entitled to um, that had been placed in a national forest. And that included the eastern side of Pazzo. But the white people who had settled in Track D, their descendants, have refused repeatedly up to the present to recognize that this is uh, the actual boundary of the Yakima Reservation. And in 2015, when the state of Washington retroceded law enforcement and civil jurisdiction over Track D back to the Yakima Nation, stuff hit the fan. Uh, and the government of Klickitat County, including their constitutional sheriff, um, Bob Songer, posing here with windmills and a pistol. I don't know if he's going to shoot the windmills or he's guarding the windmills, but um, he, um, he and the county prosecutor uh, basically said, we don't recognize this decision. Uh, we don't recognize that this land belongs to the Yakimas. We will continue to exercise criminal jurisdiction over it, which forced the Yakima Nation to go to court um, yet again, and it was in that uh, proceeding that um, I served as an expert witness on behalf of the Yakima Nation um, based on work I had actually started in graduate school not knowing what I was looking at and then had later published it as an article. It's fun to be cross-examined about your old articles by hostile attorneys, but um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the important point is we won. The Yakima Nation, I didn't win. The Yakima Nation won. Um, the county took it hard. Here's the good people of Glenwood <laughs> receiving the news uh, that they lost in court um, and then pledging to challenge it. And they did. They lost at the appeals level. And then just a few months ago, the Supreme Court denied cert and said, we're not going to hear it. Um, and so, fingers crossed, not good. Uh, that's the end of it in terms of the legal battle. Um, but the Klickitat County government spent about a million dollars of taxpayer money, including taxpayer money paid by native residents of Klickitat County, um, to fight this all the way to the Supreme Court. So it's a good example of how, you know, history ain't over till it's over, right? And it's never over. The past is always with us. And it's important that we learn about the past in its fullness, in, including its, its ugliness sometimes. Um, but also, you know, that we tell students, um, and again, I'm powerless to, wait a minute, uh, to click on that. Can, Raven, could you, or someone? Could someone click on that link? Because I want to show these photos real quickly. It, it's important, thank you, that students here, you know, that Native American history isn't always about loss and defeat and decline and disappearance. That sometimes, particularly when they refuse to take no for an answer, um, they win and they get land back. So I created this uh, album of pictures that I took when I went out to uh, participate in that event. And um, if you yeah, click on the little three dots there, I think it'll give you the slideshow option. Yeah, just click there, and then it'll cycle through. Uh, so there's Pazzo. Um, 
But it was, it was nice, it was very gratifying as a historian to uh, be able to participate in a, in a moment when um, the tribes were able to celebrate uh, their victory and the vindication of their claims to Pato and to Track D. Um, so here you see images from that ceremony, which also involved members from the Macaw uh, and Lummi nations, because in the 70s, their leaders had backed the Yakama Nation in their fight uh, to get the mountain back. And some of those people spoke um, at this event. And so I shared this album with my students because I think it's important for them, uh, for all of us to understand that land back isn't just a slogan or a hashtag. It's a political program, it's a demand for justice that has produced significant results for indigenous nations in the past and can do so again. It may take decades of intergenerational commitment and struggle, like the struggle for recognition here, uh, to achieve the goal, as well as continued vigilance to guard against new threats, because some people just ain't gonna admit the truth. Um, it may not restore everything an indigenous community is entitled to in terms of full justice, but land back can happen when native nations refuse to take no for an answer or accept money as a substitute um, and they receive support from fellow tribes, powerful politicians, influential celebrities. Marlon Brando got involved. He was everywhere. Uh, and other allies. So the restoration of Pato and Track D to the Yakima Nation in 1972 is an important reminder of what is possible when people of goodwill work together to connect correct past mistakes and resolve old injustices. And we've seen it here most recently with the restoration of a smaller amount of land to the Rappahannocks. So with that, um, thank you. And uh, I'll, I'll take questions in the time we have left. And, and I, that's a good point. That's a good point. We want to see this. I mean, there's a tendency to try and latch on to this as sort of a turning point in, in a larger history of the federal government refusing to do its mistakes. But Nixon, when he signed that executive order, said it's really because of these unique, unprecedented circumstances and that the land is still in federal hands that I'm willing to turn it back uh, to the Yakima Nation. Um, and so, yeah, there are many other tribes with uh, just legitimate claims to land uh, that have not um, even received recognition like the Chinook Nation in Oregon. Um, so it, it's, it, but it is one case at a time. It is having to fight these battles over and over and over again. Even for one nation, like the Yakima Nation hasn't fought this battle once. It's like every 20 to 25 years they've had to fight this again and again and, and you know, um, retrain the monkey, so to speak, you know, that this is in fact um, theirs. Thank you. Thank you.